What Drives You is brought to you by Ziggler, your premier source for equipping life and leadership coaches. Visit Ziggler.com and let them inspire your true coaching performance. Yeah. Welcome to What Drives You. I'm Kevin Miller, your host and guide to help you master your inner drive so you can live a driven, inspired, and peaceful life that sees you driving further and enjoying the ride. In this episode, I bring you Matthew Del Negro and what drives him. So Matthew is a celebrated actor credited for roles in some of TV's most renowned and award-winning shows such as Sopranos, Scandal, Goliath, West Wing, and films like Hot Pursuit and Wind River. He appears in all three seasons of Showtime's City on a Hill opposite Kevin Bacon. He plays Detective Kaysen. In this episode of our show here with me, he referenced talking with Kevin Bacon on the set just the day before. I was admittedly honored that he chose to spend time with me, a little bit lesser known Kevin. Uh, I had him on the show, of course, to talk about what drives him. Matt said that being a professional actor is a career of being told no for a living. And three years ago, he decided to give voice to this journey of overcoming rejection by starting a podcast called 10,000 No's. And from the success of that podcast, he was off, actually offered a book deal. And his book is also titled 10,000 No's. And that's why he's here. I was intrigued by the personal story of him starting out as the peacekeeper in his family, uh, about being shattered by a breakup with a girlfriend and finally finding himself and taking up acting later in life. And what were his motives? What drove him, good and bad? And as you'll hear, he we really resonated as we got to the heart of motives and drive overall. So you can find Matt's book. It's called 10,000 No's. You can find that on Amazon, uh, whatever podcast player you're on right now, you can just type in 10,000 No's. You'll find him there. And if you want to see him in action, go check him out at City on a Hill. It's on Showtime. And I see him a lot also on Instagram. He's under, it's Matty Dell, M-A-T-T-Y-D-E-L. Hey, I, you know, right in the beginning of the book, you start off with some of, you know, the heartbreak, some of the things in your life that really, that really, uh, you know, changed the trajectory for you. But I was really enamored, Matthew, with you talking about being the youngest in your family. You had, you were one of three kids, right? Yeah. One of three yep. kids. And that you right away found your role as peacekeeper. Uh, and talked about, I, I literally, the quote that I pulled out from you was my why was forged in the pain of my parents' marriage. You know that that strong motive, man, that early programming that takes us forward is so foundational. Why, why do you feel like you became that, the peacekeeper? Well, it's interesting you pulled that out because um, it's funny. My, my parents are, you know, they spoke split after college, but I'm actually going to see them today as we're talking, they're going to come and they're coming together to see me. I'm here on location really? in New York and like, they're still friends. And the, the, the marriage, it's not like, um, I grew up in some with a parents with a horrible marriage. They're such great people. It was more of this there was an unspoken kind of, uh, tension or something. And I think, um, without realizing it, I was probably very sensitive on some way I picked up on it. And, um, and I, I think as the youngest, maybe that just became my role, which was my sister is five years older than me and we had a connection, but she was a lot older at the time. You know, it, it was different when you're kids. And then my brother and I shared a room and he's three years yeah. older. And, and so I had a connection with him, but then I was kind of like, tight with everybody in my family. And I was, I almost became the translator in some ways, uh, which as my career and life unfolded makes sense, uh, that I'm an actor and then I have a podcast. It all makes sense now in retrospect. Well, but, and you said um, that, that you found yourself again, from a, a role relating to people well, and found yourself explaining uh, one person to another, just as you did in your family. Were you aware of that at that point or is that I, retrospect? I don't know. No, I'm not sure if I was aware, but I mean, I, I think throughout my life, I've always had 
friendships that were pretty deep. I mean, I feel like I've had conversations, you know, by the time I started the podcast, which was only three and a half years ago, I realized like I've been having conversations like this uh, my whole life. It's just, I'm, I'm interested in what makes people tick much like you, you know, that that's, um, I, I was kind of always that guy that in high school, I think you would consider me like a jock because I played sports and all that, but I was friends with people that were not like, I, I never really, I hope if you went back and asked people that, that grew up with me, I, I never really judged someone based on uh, what they did. I was more um, interested in kind of like what was underneath it. And so I ended up even in that role being kind of a, a guy who was friend, you know, had, I had my group of friends, but I was, you know, a bit of a, uh, a peacekeeper between different groups in some way. You said, um, you, you know, back to, I mean, the overall message of 10,000 notes, you talk about as being an actor, you are, you're being told no for a living. So from a broad brushstroke, would you say that that is somewhat the industry? I mean, you're going to get very few yeses. They may be huge and awesome, but that is part of it. If you're going to come into acting, then just like sales, you better be used to rejection. Is that fair? Yeah. It's a little bit like, you know, the way I put it is it's like rejection is built into the game. It's kind of like if you're a baseball player, you're, you're one of the best baseball players and you are not reaching base seven out of 10 yeah. times that is built into the game. If, if you fall apart every time you don't reach first base, you should not be a baseball player. Yeah. And if you fall apart, every time you're hurt, you hear the word no, as an actor, you should find another career because even the ones that are super successful are, you know, I mean, this is, it feels like a name dropping thing, but literally yesterday I'm having this conversation with Kevin Bacon on our set and you go, Kevin Bacon, this dude is, you know, look at his career. It's the tip of the tip of the tip of the top. And he's, and I was joking with him because he said he would sit down with me for 10,000 no's. And I'm like, yeah, you look at you. And he goes, oh yeah, I was born. And it just all just happened. Like he said it laughing, basically going like, no, it never ends. Like the, as an actor and and I've come to learn I think any industry when you get to the top and you see these people that you you look at them and you go god that guy's flying around in a private jet that guy's doing this or that whatever it is uh, the story is not that simple anybody anybody who has done anything has been has had to learn how to get over adversity, how to be told no and keep moving on. It's just a fact of life. No one gets out unscathed. Okay. That's interesting. So you, so yesterday you're on set yesterday, how many uh, actors, actresses there on set of this big show? I mean, you know, to, that, that have in essence, to, you know, to us folks, like, you've made it. Okay. So you, this is not small time stuff. How many were there? Just numbers. Are you three, uh, 13 for, for yesterday's yeah. particular scene, uh, principal actors, uh, there were actually a lot in this scene. Let's see. There was me, there was, uh, Kevin, there's another Kevin, there was Aldis, there's, uh, Cornell, there was Warren, uh, in this particular scene, there were, uh, uh, well, four of us that were series regulars, there were maybe six people in this scene. And that was kind of a bigger scene, six or seven people. So knowing what uh, you've gone through, because I mean, I'm here to talk about your motive, what drove you, but do you sometimes look around and go, man, you know what they've dealt with? You, you know what they've gone through? Uh, it's kind of like I've been watching Jerry Seinfeld's comedians in cars uh, get, uh, getting coffee and he likes to hang around other comedians because he gets them, you know? So, so here you are, you get these people, you know what they've done. If I was on set, I had no idea what you guys have, have gone through. So you look at them. Do you ever wonder, man, I know, I know kind of what drove me. You know, this is a ton. What drove them? I mean, was, do you find similarities in that or do you find very different reasons from actor to actor? There, there are uh, different specifics, but overall with actors, uh, there's a desire to tell stories. Um, there's a desire to use all of our experiences, all of our emotions uh, 
to, to put that into our work. And, and, you know, another story with Kevin from yesterday was just kind of talking to him. And he was saying that he and his wife, Kira, who directed us in an episode last year, Kira Sedgwick is also an actor. They made a film that he said is actually getting kind of traction at, at film festivals. They made it on their iPhones. They shot it themselves. Their kids were in it and they did it. I don't know where they did it, but like, there's just a, you know, and, and it sounded like he had a ball doing it. And there, there's just this desire to create. And I think that um, that is probably a common thread, a desire to express oneself. And yes, you could do the, the bigger jobs. I put them in quotes, the bigger jobs that are maybe more, uh, and again, in quotes, real. But a lot of times when you talk with each other, you realize the things you really care about are these little, you know, guerrilla filmmaking experiences that you have where you're it's on the fly and it's a it, it's a it's like a experimental and um in in a way that's the podcast has been that for me it's just this there's no there's no restrictions on doing it there's no permission to be sought out it's just like hey do you want to talk boom because it's like do you want to zoom i don't care you could be in australia boom and there we go and there's something liberating about that mm-hmm. um and then there's also another side of it, which was, which is doing these things that are more, uh, you know, plotted out and planned out. But there's, there's just, just a desire, I think, for expression, spontaneity, um, telling stories, understanding different people from different walks of life, all of it. You said, and I don't know if I put down a note, but to some degree, you realize that acting it was the thing that would allow you to be fully you. I mean, you know that in a vocational standpoint, how rare that is for people to be aware of themselves enough to locate a role, a job, a, a business, whatever, that is going to allow them. Because I, I, as, I, as I read that, I thought, man, I, I feel fortunate because I feel like I kind of fell into it. Or maybe there was enough out there that I, I got myself steered that way, but thank goodness, because I just, I can't, I can't fit anywhere else than where I am now. So when you came, how were you really cognizant of that when you, cause you came to the point of college and saying, okay, and here I've gotten my degrees, I've gotten my training, I can go out here into the workforce, but nope, I'm going to go over here. How, how aware were you? Or was it just, would you say back then it was probably kind of a gut, thank goodness. Or did you really conceptualize? No, it has these qualities. That's a fit for me. Huh? It was well. Huh, that's a great question. It was. It was a. It was a bit of both. Like so, there was always a searching quality for me of going. What What do I want to do? And my mom was a special ed teacher at my high school. My dad. Um, was a lawyer in, in his own, he had started his own private practice. Um, but he kind of, you know, great lawyer, great human, not a great businessman, but like he, he, like both of my parents had this kind of, uh, teaching quality to them. But the way my dad would talk about the law, I always thought, oh, I'll be a lawyer because he, he talked about it in a way that was very, um, uh, philosophical and ideal. And I always thought that's what I'll do. I was an English major. I kind of like fell into that by default, but as I went along, you know, I ended, I drove cross country with a buddy of mine from high school after my freshman year of college. And I remember that whole trip. I, one of the things we did, we got to California and we stayed with my cousin who has since passed away, uh, kind of tragically at the age of 44. And he was a, uh, uh, an entrepreneur and in a real quintessential entrepreneur. And I remember staying with him in Hermosa beach and he, he was 27 at the time, I think. And I, I, I just remember, which seemed so old, but he was like, you know, in shape. He, I played lacrosse in college. He also had played lacrosse at Bucknell. And I remember him like getting up in the morning and just, boom, he jammed open the the blinds and he goes, carpe diem boys, carpe diem. And he was so fired up about what he did. And I was like, 
that's how I want to be. I mean, I literally remember, I was like, that's how I want to be about whatever I do. And then we drove, my buddy and I got sick of each other. We drove all the way across the country, like in a straight shot where one of us would drive a whole tank yeah, of gas yeah. while the other one slept and yeah. vice versa. And we went, our buddy was uh, doing summer school at Duke. We went all the way across and that whole ride, I remember just kind of thinking, meditating while going across America. What do I want to do? What do I want to do? It was like, I was just searching, like what is going to really do it for me? And then it was the, it wasn't until the following summer when I was in Italy and a breakup with a girl yeah. and I, you know, I kind of got pummeled and luckily I had this journal my sister had given me and everything came out, man. Everything came out and it was just like in that first journal are the, the first traces of me going, maybe I want to be uh, an actor. Maybe I want to be a writer, but like I, I, I wasn't cognizant of it. There was nothing. It was like a voice came like a geyser out of me and grab me. Like, I wanted to just stuff it down, man. I did not want to deal. Cause I'm like, I don't know what that that's about. I play lacrosse. I'm at Boston college. Like I'm going to like go, you know, be like a normal person. <laughs> what the hell is happening? And it just grabbed me by the throat. And I, that spun my whole life in a different direction. It took a little time. I went back, played fall ball. I kind of got back on the beaten path for a little bit and then realized like, nope, don't want to do this. Went out for a play junior year. How old were you when you made your first buck acting? <laughs> uh, it was a little bit. It was a little bit. Um, so let's see. That summer of between sophomore and junior year was summer of 92. I moved into New York City after graduating in 94. I moved in January 1st, 95. I would guess I didn't make a buck until, I don't know, maybe like 1998, 99-ish. And it wasn't like I made a lot of bucks. It was like, you know, the big, the big breaks at the time were like, you know, two commercials that actually made me some real money. Yeah. A lot of it was like unpaid black box theater student films, independent films that paid me nothing. I bartended. That's how I made my money. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. talk so much about work ethic and well, again, going back to early on, you said the fact that I made it as far as I did in athletics is a sheer reflection of a burning desire in me to be accepted and valued. So when I go back as a kid, um, I had, I was ta taught and showcased, but I also grasped onto work ethic and I was going to do more. I was going to do it better. I didn't realize that I was doing it though, to feed my self image. That is who I became. It, I was expect, I wanted the accolades. I needed that. So for you to say that, because you go back to you saying, I didn't feel like you were the most you know, naturally gifted athlete, but you did what you had to do stuck with it. And you had success. And that really feels like that's what you, you relate to acting as well. And Page 16 of the thing. I, I love this because you got me thinking about myself. You said work ethic, uh, the need to have worth a, work ethic because God-given talent would not be enough. So I'm reading this yesterday and it kind of stopped me. And I thought, I, I think I have tried to coast too much on whatever I was naturally good at, just be good at it and not always hone it. And for you to come back and say, no, that's, that's work ethic because we felt like, and you related to some other actors, I think. Uh, in the in the book, and I didn't pull them out. Who realized, or you had the the perception of my God given talent will not be enough, which we know it's not in and of itself. But again, so going back though, you know that burning desire to be accepted and valued was that the thing that was the primary driver early on. You know. <sighs> It's interesting to hear that me kind of psychoanalyzing myself now and looking back, um, I definitely think that was a part of it. Yeah. Um, I also think I was truly uh, inexplicably obsessed like with sports to the point where like the funny thing is from probably high school on, I almost dropped out of being like a pro sports fan. Like in high school, I was almost more aware of like the sports that were going on in my area yeah. with other high schools. Uh, so as a, as a, as an adult, I'm not like a, 
I love sports, but I'm not a guy who's, you know, watching, spending a ton of my time watching sports. Um, but when I was a kid, it was like, I would see, there was a show, I remember a show called White Shadow and it was a great show, but it was like, there was always so much talking and there'd be like a little bit of basketball. Cause there was, it was about a basketball coach. And I'd be like, oh, I was just so anything that had to do with sports. Anytime I'd see a commercial for Monday night football, it was like, a, there was something innate in me. And yet I also think that underlying what I said in the book there, that, that wanting to be someone or feeling outside of where I wanted to be always feeling like it's over there. And I still have, I still have a bit of that as an actor, as an adult, I think in the last couple of years, what's happened is I feel less, I feel more as though I'm where I want to be. I feel more like, oh, okay. I like my life. It's not perfect, but I like, I like where I am. And I think I spent a lot of time and it still exists. There's still, this is part of probably what drives me and maybe will be with me till the grave. Uh, there's a, there's a striving something within me and I'm not quite sure I could tell you exactly where it comes from or what it is. There's a drive. There's a, there's like a fire burning that, that uh, I've realized now because I've been pummeled so hard and I keep on coming for more pummeling, whatever reason, there's a, there's a, there's a fire that won't, that, that won't be uh, snuffed out somehow. It just, it's just there. I can't, I'm not sure I can explain it. With this focus on, you related the story of like not really realizing that some people, maybe those close to you saw you as this king of dealing with rejection, right? Uh, you had somebody come to you. I like, said, you said you didn't, didn't realize that. And now to come out with it, did, do you feel like you have dealt with persevered, overcome more than the norm, or you just found it as a muse that benefited you and you wanted to share the message. Does that make sense? Is that fair? Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I certainly don't think I've overcome more than the norm because um, I have, I mean, I, I have, I think professionally it feels like whew, there's always something, but what I've learned and really, you know, the premise of the podcast really was if, if I feel like this, let's see if everybody else feels like this. And by okay. sitting down with so many people, I've realized everyone feels this way. I mean, everyone feels like they've had to overcome a lot because you sit down with anyone, they've had to go through some things. I just happened to articulate it, I think. Okay. You said at the beginning of your story, or actually, I don't know. You came back to, you know, fifth grade. I, I, I couldn't, and you literally, this is in the book. I could never seem to attain the things I wanted the most. And then later on, you said, despite the successes that you had accumulated at, at whatever point, I largely felt like I was not enough. So I pulled those out. I talk a lot because it's part of my story that even here today, despite the, you know, millions of downloads and, and, and the success I generally step up here initially, I'll forget about it and with imposter syndrome. And I look at it, I recognize it. I can wave to it. It's not going to deter me, but it's just so curious. I'm just, why, why do I still have that despite, you know, cause I'll talk about it with my family and the, what it makes no sense. And like you said, you've, you said that uh, in relation to something uh, a minute ago that it probably will never go away. You'll take it to your grave, but you saying that early on, that as well, that feeling of not being enough or not getting the things you want most, is that still trailing along there or have you been able to leave that one? I think I've, I've left it in terms of like, it doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, make, like I said, I feel like I'm where I want to be largely. There are still so many things I haven't done, but I actually don't think that that's such a bad thing. I, I know people talk about imposter syndrome uh, and talk about, um, you know, 
I don't know. I, I think there's something about that, that that's the chip that I put on my shoulder to motivate me. If, if I felt like, oh yeah, I got it. I'm great, man. I'm just, you've arrived. Everything's yeah. Everything. I don't have to do, worry about anything. I think that's to me, that's complacency and that's the beginning of a slow death. Uh, for me, the, the, it's, it's kind of like, it's, it, it depends on the relationship. There's, there's, there's a spectrum. I think if you feel like you're a piece of dirt and you don't deserve anything and you always, you want to be over there and not where you are, I don't think that's so great. But if you feel so self-satisfied, like somebody who just stuffed themselves and like a, a glutton at a meal, I don't think that's so great either. I like to keep a little bit of hunger. I like to keep a little bit of that attitude that I think I got from sports, which is there's always someone out there working harder than me. So, somewhere. so humility in essence. Yeah. There's just like, look at, did you see the, the Jordan, uh, you know, the, um, um, ah, what was the ESPN, uh, the last dance. Did you see that series? Uh -uh, uh -uh. Oh my God. You got to see it. Yeah. You in particular okay. have got to see this, but Michael Jordan had this thing. It, it's amazing to watch just a study of a guy who is a, we all unilaterally agree is this champion. Yeah. Well, when you see the mindset, the psychology, the, the psychology that is, that goes behind it, he would do things to get mad or to prove himself. And he would really almost manufacture this hunger to prove someone wrong. And that's what drove him. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, sometimes in an almost psychotic sociopathic way, but it was fascinating, man. And so I think there's not like, I, I, I sometimes think it's not such a bad thing to yeah. have a little bit of, of like, Oh, crap, I better, I better show up and I better bring it because if I don't, there's some young hungry kid out there who's going to take it. Yeah. So I better put my best foot out there. Uh, you know, I don't think that's the worst thing in the world. I agree. It's in, I'll, cause I'll watch that. I, I think I've heard of that because I, I remember you relating it to him doing that. I found myself pondering because I, I feel like there's been things in life where I've, I've made it harder than it needed to be, or I've taken the harder road and I don't know why, but I found more satisfaction out of it. I probably should unpack that uh, a bit. You know, your story of the breakup. So you're in Italy, a girlfriend and, and breakup and how, I don't know if you'd say beneficial it was, but it was a big catalyst. I mean, I, I find very few successful people. I mean, there's not many books on my shelf behind me for people who don't have some um, catalyst, something that happened that shifted. There was a shift. There was a pivot, whatever you want to call it there. And for you, that was there a emotionally leading up to that though? You know, she broke up. It didn't go from, I didn't get the feeling of you woke up, everything was picture perfect and boom. She broke up with you and devastation and you journaled and all this stuff came out that there was some unrest leading up to that, that opened you up for that. Is that, is that true? Yes. And I wasn't even aware of it because, um, it's funny. It's, it's so funny. Cause I haven't seen that, that girl in, in I don't know, decades, but it wasn't in a way her, importance in my journey was not even particular to her. It was more, yeah, it was kind of like where I was like, this was yeah. that I, it was kind of like the first person that I really thought that uh, I was like, Oh, I think I'm in love with this person. But as it went on, I was having all these doubts and unrest before that trip to Italy that I was kind of squashing down, squashing down. And just just with was, her or with life in general at that time? Uh, with her, I think with her, with the relationship, but I didn't want to hear them because it all seemed so perfect on so paper. It was, so it was more the ideal, not her. Yeah, it was like the ideal and it was like me, you know, kind of squashing down stuff that we, maybe wasn't so perfect. And then that's what what kind of brought up the whole thing coming about was me going, yeah, we see things a little differently on this, this, this. And I said something that she, that she was like, well, that's just me. 
And I was like, ah, uh, no, I didn't mean it. And then it was like, boom, it was like done. Like I got, I got honest. And then that honesty was not necessarily, uh, received in the way that I thought that it would come across. And then that kind of spy that caused me to then go like, backpedaling and looking and looking into myself and and then then this whole just treasure trove of of like stuff that was i guess unresolved from growing up all came up which was you know i don't even know the gist of it was not really fully expressing myself which is kind of interesting because now i'm in a profession where I am paid to express myself. So I put myself in a position where I, I, I can't really let that happen again, keeping, keeping a lid on emotions. Well, you said the word with her of finally saying something that was honest. Do you look back from that time of going forward, at least with the relationships, you were more honest? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, it's not like I wasn't being honest with her before then. I think I was honest about the good stuff, but had a harder time being honest about the complicated or more, you know, not so great stuff. Um, you know, I think in general, if you want to, you know, psychoanalyze me and go back to the, the stuff I said earlier of that role in the family. Yeah. Um, that I was the peacekeeper. So, so there's a, there's, it's easier for me to mend things, to bring people together, to, um, make everybody feel comfortable than it is to be confrontational. And part of my journey professionally certainly has been, um, being comfortable, being uncomfortable, you know, confronting people. I, I, I've learned, you know, I started this thing called 10,000 no's thinking it was about the external no's that came to me. And what I've learned is that I've given myself the biggest no's, yeah. you know, they, they come from me uh, and, 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 and really the no's that need to be given are, we should be giving no's to people rather than giving no's to ourselves, And I don't mean to people, I mean, I mean, to, we should be say, learning to say no to things to keep our, our, uh, our boundaries, yeah. you know, no, I can't do that. I have to take care of myself. No, I can serve you better. If I say no to you now, uh, this little request that you want, because I'm building something that's bigger, that's going to help you more later. Uh, you know, just boundaries. Yeah. You, you know, when you look at your own drive and here you are back here, when you started acting today, you're, you know, in New York right now, you'll see your wife, your kids, how old are your kids? 13 and 10. My Thir son's 13. My daughter's 10. 13, 10. How has your, when you look at what those drives were, so we talked about, you know, some of the, some of the early drives, how have they What's the fruition of those be? Because you're an actor. So, I mean, this, you know, you, you're a, a celebrity and you could look at that and go, man, I want to be, I just, I want to be the best actor I can be or the, you know, the best at some level, or I just want to be, you know, worthy of being amongst this type of uh, an industry or man, I just want to provide for myself, make some money, you know, support my family, or I want, you know, the fame. I mean, you could go along that. And when I go back to that question of the people on the set yesterday, I'm sure I could find that driver of those uh, uh, differing amongst those. And you, and you see that, but how has yours, how has yours shifted? Because I mean, I've been doing what I want to do most of my life, but man, I sure have seen the motives change. Yeah. Um, I, I do think that there's been a, a shift more toward, you know, I I'm trying to maintain this thing where I'm, I'm following my inspiration and I'm, uh, you know, hopefully setting an example for my kids of, um, you know, what my grandfather told all of us, he, he always said, you know, do what you love and the money will follow. And he said that to all me, my, my siblings, and my cousins, he was an and immigrant, right? Immigrant. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was, he was actually, um, he was, born here, went back to Italy when he was two, 
and then came back here when he was 17. Okay. Um, and um, he, yeah, I, I hope that um, my kids, <laughs> the, the, the good and the bad of being an actor is the, the uncertainty, which is really what all the 10,000 No stuff is about. It's about dealing with uncertainty because, you, you know, through much of my adult life, you just, when you finish a job, you don't know what's next. You don't know if there is a next. Um, you hope, but the, you're only as good as your last job in my industry. Um, and, and that's that's a crazy thing as the head of the household. That's a really crazy thing. That is, that is an odd one. Because, I mean, if I look at you and put you in the category of an artist, which to some degree I put us all you know, in that. But you're in one. I mean, I've got a good buddy who's a, a renowned sculptor. Sculptor. And, you know, he's like the common artist, you know, he'll do one job and maybe not have lined another one up, but he can go make something. He can create something, do that. You can't just go into your studio. Well, you can podcast, you know, but from an acting standpoint, you're at the, you've got to get somebody to say yes, or yeah. you can't just or, create, or you on create your, own. your own thing. I guess well, more is like sure. your friend, your sculptor friend, he can go make something at any time. Yeah. Can he sell it? Well, that's that depends on true. you know it's it's really it's it's uh artists and entrepreneurs are um very similar beasts i've i've come to find out um so yeah there's there's that side of what i'm saying about balancing it's like as a head of a household to provide for my family and give them some stability which we have not always had um and then on the other side to provide an example for them of going after what they love following their passion and somehow figuring out how to turn that into something that can provide. Or if you can't, figuring out how you can build something else that's providing while still following your passion. You know, so it's a, it's a, yeah. it's a balancing act. Were you saying that going after what they, what, what you love following a passion uh, I mean, another thing I pulled out of the book, you said the pain of not acting for me outweighed the fear of falling on my face in front of others. I, I love that because it's not the, I speak a lot contrary to the, you know, the no fear, the, you know, t-shirts, ball caps, the no fear. I think if you don't have any fear, you're psychotic. Uh, and here you saying it didn't have anything to do. The fear was every bit as much there, but the desire overcame that. Again, I, I want people to hear it. The pain of not acting for me outweighed the fear of falling on my face in front of others. I mean, that's, well, that goes to the why. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep reading you your own book. Uh, here <laughs> I because, love it, man. Well, this is, this is... Because you got the, you got the book. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, you're, you're an actor, you write this about rejection, but it's, it's, you know, disguise, it's a self-help book. This is a, a, a profound personal development book. And you've got as one part, something that I pulled out. That's really the essence of my book. So this is right out of page seven. The why is the fuel that will propel you. A strong why will obliterate all the inevitable blockades and barriers you will undoubtedly face no matter what field you choose. If your why is not aligned with your innermost joy and your biggest dreams, you may find success, but eventually you will experience some version of a breakdown. That line, in addition with, again, the pain of not acting, uh, outweighed the fear or for me, outweigh the fear of, of falling on my face in front of others. Um, that's what I want. I mean, that's the essence of what I want out of this show, out of the book is people to understand the why. So for you to pull it out there and for you, that was, you kind of put it in there as by that that's a necessary ingredient. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's, um, <laughs> I think it's a lot simpler than people make it out to be, which is, um, it's pleasure versus pain, everything, our motivation. At a certain point, you know, let's take let's take some um, you, something that you call, and I'll put it in quotes, a bad habit yeah. that you do. You do it because you're getting something out of that habit. You're getting something from it. Uh, I don't. It, it might not be what you think you want, but somehow you're getting some comfort from that habit. The only time you're going to change course is when you start to go, huh, the thing that I'm getting that I considered comfort, you know, for all this time is no longer comfort. It's, it's, it's more pain. It's more 
it's, it's pleasure versus pain. So it's not bringing me pleasure. It's bringing me pain. And at that point, I pivot and I go in a different direction. I create a new habit that's going to bring me more pleasure because that one was bringing me pain. I mean, I think it's that simple. So for me, it was like, you know, there's a lot of pain in what I do, but the, the, the pain of the alternative for me was worse. You know, for other people, it's not. That's why so many people that started out as actors are like, no way, man, <laughs> like, I'm out. Like they, because, because there is so much rejection. And, and, and a lot of people get to a point where they go, it's not worth it. This, wow. this pursuit is not worth it. It's not what I thought it was going to be when I was younger. Um, it's not because I tell you, people outside of it think it's about the fame. They think it's about all that stuff. I mean, maybe for some people it is. Um, I don't find, I mean, I find that to be the worst of it. And, and it's not like I'm not like I'm getting, you know, uh, I'm not Brad Pitt getting paparazzi, you know, following me around or anything like that. But I mean, any of that type of part of it, that's not the, that's not the draw. The draw is this. I mean, what we're doing right now, this is like the part of acting that I love. You're getting in there and you're grappling with the character. You're getting in there and you're, you're grappling with, humanity it's not it has nothing to do with red carpets and all that bs that's just to sell a product that's just you know, and that's part that's of why you're here uh, honestly matthew i i've had some authors um some fiction authors which is was a little bit out of my norm uh in the past six months or so and as i read their stuff and then talked with them and saw their the insight that it requires into humanity, even talking again about Jerry Seinfeld and kind of paying attention to, to what he's been uh, kind of promoting as far as the work of, an, of a comedian and you, the work of an actor and the work of a, of a nonfiction author. Uh, I mean, of a, I'm sorry, of a fiction author is you are you have to have some insight because you are there to move people. And that's incredibly, incredibly unique. Actually, right there, though, that that right there, I, I didn't intend to go that direction. But that's an interesting part of your craft. You are not just there, like you said, to just recite lines and you know give a facial nuance and and whatnot. But you are there on screen, and they are looking to you to move me on the other side of the screen to connect with me. It makes you a by proxy a student of human emotions, doesn't it? Absolutely. And I got to tell you something. So <laughs> I recently had someone who I was introduced to uh, through someone who was a past guest and has become a friend who's a big uh, public speaker and, and business leader. And, and he, he introduced me to the guy that, that books his speeches. Um, and I spoke to the guy and I, and, and at one point he goes, well, you know, it's good that you have a book because, you know, a lot of times people don't want to, you know, they don't want to book actors because, you know, you guys just, just memorize lines. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God. I, I said, the actors that I know are some, the, the good ones, the good ones are some of the most disciplined, intelligent, uh, 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 emotionally intelligent, um, aware sensitive human beings that I know. Like, it's amazing that there's this stereotype because I guess there are a lot of, you know, idiots out there that are giving us a bad name that are, that are, that are maybe surfacey or whatever, but like the stereotype, I was kind of blown away because I've forgotten that outside view of it. Yeah. But no, if you're really doing this, I mean, it, yeah, you can't, you you can't be good as an actor if you're not um, somewhat on some level aware of of humanity and 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 psychology and all of it. I mean, I don't know how you could do this job. I don't I don't know how you could. You know, it's curious, and I have I've got kids home for holidays, and we've had more partying than ever, and I've watched more things because they're always coming over. Oh, you got to see this, Dad, and and they'll pull something out. So somebody pulled up. Jimmy Fallon Mad Lib Theater. So he has the, I had never seen it. So he has an actor and he makes them pick out. I don't know if you've seen that. It makes them pick out words. You know, give me a noun. Uh, they give me a, give me a, you know, uh, give me a verb, 
give me a, a, a reaction, you know, whatever. And then he, they go over here and do a skit using the words they put in. It's hilarious. But what was interesting to me, and this is, this isn't a, this isn't a show on acting, but I'm curious on it too, because what I saw is going back to that, uh, actors just memorize verses. There were some, some big name actors that on those questions specifically, now when I get to the skit, they were all pretty good, but over here on just think of a word, think of a word that some of them, you think, man, they're not used to the improv of that. Some of them. And I mean, they really stumbled because I'm a stickler on, um, er, like, you know, not using filler words. And some of them, oh my gosh, they, you know, he'd ask them a question. That, um, I mean, it's just, oh, it's killing me. And some of them were spot on with improv. You obviously, I mean, I, I know that from doing the podcast, you cannot be a good conversationalist unless you can just roll with it, uh, there, but even there, I, there must be some kind of a difference. Cause these were all big actors. Some of them who are able to be quicker on the draw. And I wonder if that's just, you know, is that method acting is, I, I don't, I don't know how that relates. Well, I'm sure in that situation, there are a lot of external forces that could make someone uh, not as relaxed as they might normally be. And that's true. That's fair. maybe they're more up in their heads. I, I could say for myself, there are certain areas where I have blind spots or it's not my area of expertise. And in those areas, sure. I would not be so quick. I would look like a real idiot. Um, but when we're talking about this, you, you know, when I could just sit down with someone like yourself, who's obviously got a real interest in what makes people tick and psychology and all of it. I mean, just, I'm, I'm so flattered and impressed with you that you're picking out these quotes in my book. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed and grateful, but when I sit down with someone like you, that's talking about this, which is in my wheelhouse, yeah, I, like I told you before we started rolling, I said, just ask whatever and we'll yeah. figure it out. Uh, but, you know, would I be so smooth in, in certain situations? Probably not. Okay. If they're not really my strength. Granted, you know? which is why we're in here. We're talking in my wheelhouse specifically. Uh, we won't be talking about politics or finance or anywhere where I'll get derailed and I'll sit there and go, um. That's my, yeah, those are my blind spots. That's what I'm thinking of. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So here you are, uh, acting career, you know, picks up, th things are good. What did bring you to that? Well, no, I know the catalyst uh, to, to some degree of you deciding to, uh, you know, do a podcast, but where, you know, some more reason, why did you, you could just stick with acting. This is what I do. That's what I do. What did give you the thought of, man, I really do want to give a voice, as you said before, take this topic and give a voice to that. Why? Well, the, the tagline of 10,000 No's is failure is opportunity. And that comes from my dad used to say, mm -hmm. failure is just opportunity in disguise. And it came out of failure. This this podcast. It, it, I was working, um, I was working on a show called Scandal for a little while, and um, I was not under contract, but I was recurring on it for right. a, a few seasons, and was told, uh, "Okay, this next season, we're gonna they're gonna need you in, in a big way." And um, I, I read it more money, but then yeah. they were going to, you had to be exclusive just to them. So it's going to tie you down. You, no, 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 this is a, di no, this is actually a different show. Oh, is that this, different? <laughs> this is another story, okay. which was, so we moved, we had, we had also, it had coincided with a move to uh, the neighborhood where we live now. And so the, you know, the expenses were a little bit more and all of a sudden scandal kind of inexplicably, my storyline went away. Uh, and there's no recourse for me because I wasn't under contract. It wasn't like, you know, where, and actually even in my business, even when you are a series regular under contract, you really can still be replaced. It's kind of a little bit crazy, but all of a sudden I went with no work and it coincided with something that was going on politically that was just not uh, good for me personally within my business in terms of like I, my type was not being hired so much at this particular point. And I went on a stretch of unemployment that was scary and frustrating. And I started thinking about my relationship to when I wasn't working. And, mm. you know, I told you before we were rolling, I'm from the East Coast. My wife's from the East Coast. We, we moved out West when I was doing West Wing. 
but you would come back for, you know, weddings and you'd see relatives that you haven't seen in a while. And when I was working, it's like, oh yeah, great. And you talk. And then when you, when I wasn't working, they go, what are you up to? And this is like, historically, this goes back, you know, think about that. You go back and you see people, they're like, oh, so you're still doing that acting thing? You know, that's how people <laughs> yeah. think of it. It's yeah. like not even a real thing. Sure. And and there was all this shame and backpedaling and trying to shuffle around and present it in a great way. But you knew you felt terrible because you, you really weren't working. And I just decided to take, it, it was this combo of frustration, uh, desire to uh, be creative without having to get permission. Um, and also to take the shame of nose, which which equi- the equivalent was unemployment, was uh, you know that's a hard thing to deal with. I mean, and as an, people don't realize that as an actor, like you go through stretches sometimes, you don't know what's coming next, and that's what I did with Ten Thousand Nose. I said instead of hiding this and and acting like it doesn't exist, I'm going to go. No, no, no. You know what? Here it is, guys. Boom. I'll take all of my rejection, all of that shame, all of those no's. I'm going to put it, I'm going to make it my calling card. And that flip, I'll tell you, maybe it's a coincidence. I don't think so. But my career, both the artistically and financially, since I started the podcast has been like, on a, on a, on a line graph, I'd say in general, my career has been like this, you know, ups and downs, but it went like that. Wow. And I, and I think it's because I opened myself to just, Hey, this is where I am. It's not ideal. It's not what I, you know, if you interviewed the 22 year old Matt Del Negro, when I was, you know, before I moved into the city and I was taking trains into the city for classes, two nights a week and reading, you know, premier magazine, I was like, Oh, I want to be Brad Pitt. I want to be Tom Cruise. I want to be, you know, I'm going to be there in 10 years. I'm not. I'm still not, and I'm older than that. So I, I didn't, but I, what I think I did that helped was I just went, this is where I am. For better or for worse, it's better than a lot of people. It's not exactly where I wanted to be, but this is it. And when I leaned into that and just was like, I'm okay with it. And actually, there's something cool about this. All of a sudden, doors opened up. Wow. That's the wow. book deal that came out of this whole thing. I didn't plan that. You know, it's been, it's been a really cool ride. And, and I would think like for your listeners, that the, the moral of the story would be like, you know what? Yeah. It's not perfect for you right now. It's not perfect for anyone, but like, just make friends with what is it, And when you do that, all of a sudden there's like so much less energy going into trying to, you know, shuffle around this thing, this facade to present to everybody. And you're just like, yeah, you know what? It's cool. Some days it's rough. Some days it is what it is. And something about that, I think people really respond to because they just go like, oh yeah, that's how I feel. Like, you know, all the BS you see on social media, people making it look pop, pop, pop. I got this. And it's like, come on, man. You, you know, you got some good stuff. You got some not good. So good stuff. And that's life. It's complex. It's not black and white. It's gray. Well, as often as the case, I end up on these shows and feel like it was meant to be because it was something I needed. And I don't, I, it wasn't a big positive, wasn't a big negative, but it just, it did by proxy make me reflect a little bit. And I'm looking around and we're back to that thing of looking at, at the successes and the you know wealth of my home and my family and, and business and thing that's happening. And yet it's so difficult not to look at what I haven't done on, on what I would have liked to have achieved, you know, more and to, uh, so you talking about that being, cause it's, it's what my wife would tell me right now is, oh, come, come, give me, come on, honey, be at peace. How can you not just be at peace and be grateful? I know, I know, honey. So I'm, I've been playing with that, you know, a little bit now, but and you, you know what, can, can I speak please. to that for one second, Kevin? It's, Do it. it. I think because I've had that. I've had that a lot. And I think why I don't have it as much now, like I said, I still like to push myself and still think what else could I be doing? Someone else is working harder. I think that's good motivation, but I think 
what I've found now that's maybe a shift from what it used to be, it's actually just gratitude. It's actually just yeah. going like, you know, instead of looking at the things that we don't have, there will always be plenty of things that we don't have or accomplishments that we we have yet to achieve and maybe we'll never achieve. But instead of looking at them, like, you know, you can acknowledge them, but look at what you do have. No. I mean, the simple stuff, even the fact that we've been having a conversation for an hour here, like, how incredible is that? I could be somewhere digging a ditch right now. You know what I mean? I could be in a hospital bed right now. I could, you know, like, I I think when you do that, it's like it throws a um, a level of calm over everything. And it's just like, okay, be grateful for what you have. You know, you can still strive for all those other things, but you're satisfaction and your happiness is not going to lie in accomplishing whatever that goal is or having that particular house or that car or any of that crap. That's, that's really not going to move the needle for you. What's going to make you feel good is, is going like going to bed and looking in the mirror and being like, man, you know what? You kind of, you, you, you had a good day, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like a mind boggling day, but you, you, you know, I mean, right now I feel like this day is a win. This conversation has been awesome. Totally, I've won yeah. today. So, yeah. you know what, if I do nothing else today, I'm like, Hey, whatever date this is, I don't even know what date it is. This is a, this is a good day for me. Yeah. Good day on the earth. You know? Thank you. Yeah. I, I hear, you know, I'm going to go take a run in the snow here after we're, uh, after I mean, we're done. And how awesome is that? You're going to awesome. go take a run in the snow. It, yeah. You know, I'm going to see my parents today. Like there's a lot of stuff mm-hmm. that I think, it, you know, the, the intensity, I I'm proud of maybe the work ethic and the intensity, but I just did a, 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 a you said this earlier, so I just want to bring it up before, before we're done which is, I just did something. I do these little Monday morsel episodes uh, for yeah, the podcast yeah, I, as well. I, I listen, yeah. Oh, you did? Well, yeah. I did one. It was recently. It was maybe it doesn't have to be so hard. And the gist was like, I have I have bought into, as proud as I am uh, of 10,000 no's, because it's not about like wallowing in the no's. It's about overcoming them and flipping them around. But there's still, as I'm now going, okay, cool. I did that. But I'm going, where am I now? And I'm thinking, maybe I have bought into the work ethic, grind, got to gotta get through it mentality just a little too much. Like, does it always have to be? Like, sometimes things do just come to you and maybe accept those and receive the yes, you yeah. know? Yeah. Instead of talking about the 10,000 no's, receive the yes. You know, it's like, be open to that. And, 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 and you know be, be grateful again. That's it. And you finding this, you know, on the 10,000 nos and finding, giving it a voice is what you said. Now, do you feel like you have to some degree found a different voice of yours in the podcasting, in the book writing? And so as you look forward, I mean, you're, you know, you're not in, in, in sports that has a finite line on it with your age. You're an actor. You can do that until you, as long as you can, remember the line and, and what's going, you know, what else is going on? You can keep doing that. So when you look forward, do you think I'm probably going to you know do it as long as you can, or is this a, another direction or just in unison in alignment that you want to be pursuing this other voice as well? Uh, it's definitely, um, a combo platter acting is my, I will, I will always want to act right down to the end. Um, but I think I always want to do this too. What, what I've, what I've, um, built here on the side, uh, and there are more things that are now kind of, uh, growing out of it that are kind of an educational component with like online courses and, and this online community, uh, things that have been bubbling in me because I've realized the need for what I'm doing. Like I just, just from feedback, I'm going, okay, how can I kind of serve people better with other stuff? 
Um, but but all of it is also being built with within the parameters of it can't take up too much of my time because the main thing it's gotta it's gotta help my acting, not hinder it. And I think that it has it has um in a beautiful way, it's kind of been seamlessly integrated with my career where I feel like the podcast and all of this stuff is, is helping my career and my career is helping the podcast and it's weaving together. And I think just to bring it on home for your particular motive theme, it's because I figured out that my big why, my one thing is not acting. I think my one thing is helping people, encouraging people to not feel so alone uh, on, on their journey. And sometimes I do that as an actor by portraying a character and letting people go to a theater and see themselves in this character. Yeah. And sometimes I do it as a podcaster by bringing someone that I think is cool and going, hey, look at them. They've been through this. You're in this you know, and then sometimes I do it as kind of an educator or even on these kinds of conversations, you know, you just go on like, Hey, you listener, I get it. I feel for you. Um, but you're not alone. People, we've, we've, a lot of people have, have been there and it's going to be okay. And just, you know, take, take another step. That's all you can do. Take another step. So everything's under that big umbrella, that why. Yeah. So I think I can, I can kind of do all of them moving forward. I hope so. I hope there's more in this vein as well. I appreciate what you do, man. Thanks for, thanks for having this voice, giving this voice and, uh, and sharing it with me and the listeners today. Uh, it's a gift. It's a win day, no doubt. And I think they'll feel well, the same way, Matt. I, thank you. And your attention to detail and just the things that you picked up. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty blown away and, and extremely flattered that you, you put this much brain power into my book and, and even agreeing, you know, having me on here, uh, in, in front of your audience, it's, uh, it's truly, I'm, I'm grateful for it. And even if the thing, you know, the hard drive went down and the whole thing was lost <laughs> and no one ever heard this, I feel like, uh, I got something from talking to you. So thanks, man. Hey, likewise. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. All right, friends. Well, there you go. Matthew Del Negro. Again, you can find his book, 10,000 No's on Amazon or wherever you get books uh, in your podcast player right now. Just type in 10,000 No's. You can uh, find him there. And of course, you can watch him in action on City on a Hill on Showtime uh, and Instagram. Also, you find him at Matty, M-A-T-T-Y-D-E-L. Thanks for tuning into the show. If you appreciated this, give us a rating, if you would, on Spotify and on Amazon. You can leave a review there as well. Uh, you can see most of the shows on YouTube and on social media. Just look for me at kevinmiller.co. And if you want to learn how to master your inner drive like Matthew Del Negro, get my book, What Drives You, on Amazon. Until next time, stay driven. Yeah.